Okay. All right, let's get started. What, uh, what am I looking at? Uh, so today we're doing DOS. This is uh, a lecture that was in uh, pretty high demand over the years, or at least last semester. When I did the voting of uh, what to do in review lectures last semester. Uh, this is one of the highest voted ones. The students really want to see it. And there was some talk about it, some requests for it this year from all of you. So it's finally an official lecture, so let's do it. Uh, any, any logistics we need to talk about before then? Any questions about anything before we get going? All right, so let's do it. DOS, denial of service attack. So the general idea of a DOS attack is to shut down a site for legitimate users. They have, there's some app running on a server, and you, in general, bombard it with requests so much that it's using up all of its resources, so the server has no more resources available to serve the app to legitimate users, and nobody can use the site. You go to the site, and it says, this site's down, and nobody can use it. That's the, the gist. That's the crux of it. It's everything that we'll talk about today revolves around that. And I want to start with a question, because there's a lot of, like, I could, uh, uh, there's a lot of first thoughts that, that you'll have with how to launch one. So I want to turn it over to you, instead of having a whole bunch of slides on it, is how would you launch this attack? Just based on what you know right now, how would you launch a DOS attack? Yeah. Um, sending a Oh, you're, yeah, you're, you're jumping right to it. Yes. <laughs> that, that one I'll talk about at length. No pun intended there. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I'd probably modify the JavaScript to send a few messages back to back, just doing that, but for less a thousand. Yes, oh, I like that one. So going into anyone who didn't hear the how we did the JavaScript for testing WebSockets, you just cut and paste that line a bunch of times. Uh, why not like do that in a loop and do it a thousand or a million times and just bombard the server with all kinds of requests? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just keep saying the it, was that in uh, 365? Yeah. yeah. If, if you took 365, you know probably more about this than I'll go through today. But uh, <laughs> yeah, how else would we, we launch this attack? Oh, I'm not going to repeat that one because I have slides on it, by the way, why I'm not repeating that one for everyone, just so you know. <laughs> What's that? Shut down the server? Oh, just go into the server room and shut it down? Yes, that would be, that would be effective. It, and that's, yeah, the, if you have uh, access to the physical location, there's a lot more you could do. Uh, maybe uh, knock out the power or something. Yeah. Yeah, and remoting in. That would be, uh, you have to launch a, a separate attack first to be able to get access to remote in. And then, yeah, then just take it down. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll kind of put the umbrella over this topic is uh, DOS prevention, at least, or attacks, uh, is a constant back and forth. This really is a cat and mouse game. Uh, so in this lecture, I'm not going to have like definitive answers. I don't know what the, the current uh, meta is, if you will, of this uh, DOS attack and prevention game. Uh, it's an ongoing thing. There are attacks launched, you know, constantly these days. This is, you know, uh, an ongoing, uh, you know, an ongoing thing that that happens. So, where the current cutting edge of this prevention and attacks are, um, you know, you'd have to ask the attackers and the cybersecurity people for that one. Um, so, this is a constant back and forth. 
everybody's getting more sophisticated all the time, trying to launch more sophisticated attacks, and then seeing those attacks and having better countermeasures. Uh, it, it's, it, it would be really fun to get into, I think, uh, but not necessarily my, uh, my expertise. But I'll give you the base level. I have enough for the lecture on it. Um, but anyway, preventing this stuff is crazy. What we'll do for the project is one of the most basic forms of prevention is IP blocking. Uh, we, we looked at Project 4 in class, and I went through them. But IP blocking, if you get a lot of requests way too fast from one specific IP address, um, you know, block that IP address for a while. You know, straightforward, pretty simple prevention. Um, any attacker is going to get around that these days. I would, I would, uh, I would venture. But, uh, but that's like the first line of defense that we can build. And it's something that's simple enough that you can actually build it in, uh, in your project. OK. And I want to go to demos. We'll come back to the slides. But I think it's more fun to see these things in action. So we hope that things will go well. When doing this, and I want to show a few things. I actually didn't get to show all of these things when uh, when I was doing the automated clients that last Friday before break. Uh, I was supposed to lead into this one, and I didn't quite finish, so we'll do a few extra things here to finish these up. I have my server running here. Let me resize this. Let me open up my server. Localhost 8080. And I have a, a client here. Uh, this is using the request library. Uh, this is something I, I don't think I found any time to talk about in lecture. Um, but this is using the request library. This is like the, I don't know, my favorite, probably the most standard way to send an HTTP request in Python. It's similar to what we did before with the testing client, where we were writing our own request, uh, opening a TCP, where is it? Opening a TCP client. And then sending those bytes over the client, over the TCP connection as a client to our server, and then receiving the response, printing it out, uh, and sending requests that way. The request library just simplifies this like crazy. Uh, I'm going to do request.post, the path, any extra headers that I want. And data is the body of that request. And I can fire off this request. Oh, yeah, we did do this in lecture, because then I logged in and proved that I did actually uh, log in with that. Um, and we can take this a step further and use a WebSocket client library. And these are external libraries, by the way, just to make sure we get this out of the way. WebSockets, WebSocket client, and requests, and rel, which I, which that you don't have to use here. But um, I'm creating a WebSocket client connection. So if we want to test WebSocket client code, or if we want to simulate WebSocket connections, we can do this as well. And for this, I'm going to create a connection with that URL that we find in the JavaScript, except I have window.host, so, you know, I hard-coded localhost here. Uh, and then send over the WebSocket connection. So I'm sending a chat message, which is just spam. And it's going to go, it's going to go wrong already. Sending on port 8080, port 8080. Get that attack out of there. There we go. And then uh, I'll get a, so this specific code, it's coded a little bit different from the, uh, from the homework that we did this semester. I have random usernames, which is user, and then some random number from 0 to 1,000. So I can run this code. And then in the context of today's lecture, our next step would be, and then I got two different connections creating that code. WebSocket connections do have to persist. And we're using threading. If you're just following the, the standard recommendations of threading sockets, uh, the threading TCP server, uh, each one of those WebSocket connections is a thread. So if I do 4i in range of 
let's say 10, I'm going to create 10 WebSocket connections with this code and really start spamming this chat. Uh, but the way what I'm using right here is a connection that's going to create the connection, send a message, and then close that connection right away, which isn't really going to tie up resources of that server. It's going to create the connection and then just kill it right away. But if I do this forever connection, which uses a dispatches why I needed that rel library, I run this WebSocket connection in the background and then run many of them. Let me change this to a forever connection. I'm doing the same thing, but the connection is going to stay open and persist. And if I go into this, hopefully I can get this working the way I want it to. I gotta find Python. Maybe this one. Mm, it's already not gonna give me what I want. That's just finished. Oh no. Uh, how do you, man, I forgot how to do this. How do you sleep in Python? Anybody know? Time to sleep. We'll sleep for a second, just so that we don't get to the end of the process. Oh no. Well, well, that one. You, we'll we'll just pretend that won't work. But I I wasn't able to show what I really want to show there. But uh, I can still make the point. I crank this up, and we're going to have a whole lot of connections that are made. And we get a lot of spam in the server, and that's going to start tying up resources. We get all those WebSocket connections to, uh, to persist. And what I was hoping to see was the threads count increase here, but uh, we'll get that on the next demo. Um, but then create a whole bunch of WebSocket connections and leave them open. That's going to tie up uh, a thread in our case for each one. Uh, one of the answers to this one is not use a whole thread for each WebSocket connection. That's a little beyond what I want to talk about today. Uh, so let's go back to this test client code. And this is where we were just manually building our HTTP requests and then firing off the requests, listening for responses. We use this for testing. We had a whole bunch of asserts, making sure the response we got was what we expected. And I said, this is a way you can test without firing up your server, going to your browser and doing that. Every time you fire up your server, you run this code and then see if you got the right response based on the request. So I want to take that code as a starting point and use this to launch an attack. So what we're trying to do is just spam the server. Uh, this is our like first line of attack. We're just going to try to spam the server with a whole bunch of requests. Uh, with this one, I'm going to write a method that's going to create that socket connection, connecting to localhost 8080. That's the server I'm going to attack. Of course, my own server is sitting here. And I'm going to make a post request for chat messages or chat message. I actually want to change this. I was going to leave it on WebSockets, but I'm going to change this so we can see the attacks coming in. Um, get rid of all that. And I'm going to make a post to chat messages. So I'm switching back to homework two code where it's posting and uh, polling to get the latest chat history. I'm going to post a message. Um, Content link, content type, and if I counted these right, there should be 22 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, so 22 messages, uh, 22 characters, content length 22. I'm going to send all, and I'm going to ignore the responses. I'm not going to bother listening for the response that comes back. And I'm going to run that. We look at chat, we got attacked. 
It works. We're sending a, a message uh, using our automated client. Neat. We've done that before. And here, of course, is where we're going to for i in range of 10. And start spamming things. Let's shut down these clients. And we can spam with attacks. This is going to take quite a bit of resources to really, uh, really injure the server. Uh, the, we're just sending regular requests and you know, just trying to flood the, the server with a bunch of requests so much that it's not going to keep up with us. And I don't know, that's tough to do. But let's think about this a little more and talk about the, the first attack that was mentioned that I kind of just ignored because it's a big thing I want to talk about today, is what are we going to do? So this is 22 bytes of content. Well, if I change content length to 23, what would your server do? It's going to hang. Most likely, all of your servers would hang on this. Well, because that's the way I talked about buffering. It should hang the way, the way I presented it. If I do content length 23 here, now what my server is going to do, and you all have code that looks similar to this, I'm going to get the request. I'm going to parse the request just from reading once from the TCP connection. I'm going to check the headers if I have content length, so it's not a get request. I'm going to enter this loop and say, well, I've uh, read less than content length number of bytes from the body, receive more data, and then process that received data, and just keep looping that. I like to do this nice and two clean lines. I'm going to throw my received data back into the request constructor to parse it. Uh, that's going to give me the new body. Uh, get the length of that and check it against my content length again. And just keep doing that until I've read content length number of bytes. If the content length's wrong, which an attacker is going to intentionally crank that uh, content length up, now my server doesn't know what to do. It's going to get stuck in this loop and tie up one thread for each request that's being sent. And I went for 10 requests. This just not updating. Here we go. And we got 13 threads going for those connections. I started 10 connections. So I'm using up 13 threads of my server. Threads are really expensive. You need a new uh, stack and heap. Oh, I might have misspoke there. But threads are expensive. Let me just cap it at that because I don't remember exactly. But uh, threads are expensive. So we, we uh, want to limit the number of threads we have in a program. So 13 to handle those requests, which are never going to end. That's 13 threads that are tied up, you know, presumably forever. It, with my code here, they're going to be tied up forever. Uh, so that's bad. Now what an attacker needs to do, now it's not just sending a request and getting a response, because your server should be really fast at getting requests and responding with responses. That's what your server's designed to do. It should be fast with that. Uh, getting WebSocket messages and sending WebSocket messages back. Uh, it should be very fast doing that as well. That's the, what it's designed to do. If it's not fast at that, you got bad code. The, you you got to optimize that and, and fix something. Uh, and that's what we're all going to be you know, trained to do. That's what we learn how to do writing code. But once something goes wrong, like the content length being wrong here, now we are actually tying up quite a bit of resources. This is an attack that's going to be much more effective than just flooding the server with a bunch of requests. And if we crank this up, we can start seeing those threads really get up there. It, should go higher than that. We got 70 threads. I would expect it to go up to 100. 98. 
Is there a way to, I'm not gonna try to find it right now. Uh, we got 100 threads right now. And once we go to our site here, we should start seeing some performance hit. I'm refreshing. Remember, this is just localhost. I can't blame anything on the Wi-Fi here. That took a while to load. There's quite a bit of delay. Well, actually, that was pulling delay. Uh, but let's crank this up even more and see if we can actually get DOS. So now I can't even reach the site at all. And I'm pretty sure my server crashes here once it, oh, hey, it actually didn't crash. Uh, once it gets too many requests, it's starting to crash. I got errors all over the place, which is probably better off for me, actually, because instead of getting stuck in that infinite loop, once it crashes, that thread crashes and dies, and then it doesn't tie up resources anymore. So I think that's how it was able to recover. And if we look at our number of threads, hopefully this updates. I think this just isn't updating as often as I'd like with Activity Monitor. I think that's part of my issue right here. But we're seeing a significant hit in performance at this point. Send it. My app's unusable right now. All I did was change that content length to one, uh, one plus what the actual length of my content is. Got my server stuck in an infinite loop and really crashed that thing. So uh, right here, we're, we're stuck at this point. Uh, I got a problem on my hands. I got to shut down the server, restart it or something uh, to be able to get myself out of this state. Plus, I'm printing so much stuff to the screen with all these error messages. Now, let's see what these error messages even are. What did I get hit with? Exception occurred, processing file. Connection reset by peer. Bless you. Yeah. So we're screwed at that point. I restart my server, and then that's the only way we're really going to recover from that. Uh, so this is where the attacks get a little more sophisticated. Instead of just flooding with requests, start messing with those requests in a way that's going to, um, that's going to trick the server. So how would we prevent that? Because you have to have buffering on your server. How are we going to prevent that attack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can hang for a certain amount of time, and then if a while goes by, we don't get anything, then uh, say, you know what? This is done. Connection timed out. That's about the, you know, roughly the best we can do. All right. So let's go through these things. So first was brute force. The very first thing, the easiest thing you could do, which I was kind of hoping somebody would say, but uh, it, I understand why not. But just mash refresh. That's your easiest DOS attack. Mash refresh, or uh, you go into a Discord server, or just shout if I said, hey, everybody, go to this site and mash refresh, and get a whole group of people just mash and refresh somewhere. You know, you can get a bunch of requests in, but not a sophisticated attack by any means. But if you have a, a really small time target, you know, that might be effective enough. If you want to take out CC312, actually even better, if you want to take out Autolab, that probably, it's probably going to work. If you got like 100 of you mashing refresh, it, it's probably going to see the performance. That, uh, that's why we need to build DevView. <laughs> DevView is going to be better. But uh, uh, Autolab doesn't really handle too much load. What's the difference between DOS and DDOS? Oh, don't you worry, we will talk about it. Uh, an extra D is the, the answer. Distributed is the, the short answer. But uh, I want to build up to it, but we'll talk about it. Uh, so brute force attack, just mass refresh. OK, cool. Um, we wrote code that sends a request in a loop. That's your next step. You, instead of mashing that refresh button, write some code. Even if you write a loop that hits the refresh button for you, hey, whatever, whatever. Just get to the point where you're writing code. That's your. Uh, level one instead of level zero attack. Um, and this is going to be easy to prevent against. Really, this should be prevented against naturally, because what, effectively what you're doing is load testing the app. Where did I? I have that word somewhere. I'm blind. Write efficient code. Oh, yeah. 
Load test. It's effectively a load test, which is something I want to add eventually to 3.12. I want to load test your, your apps as part of your like a performance um, measurement and actually grade you on that. But that, that, that day is not this semester. Uh, but you're effectively load testing your app, making sure it can handle a lot of, uh, a lot of requests. And that should be part of your testing process before you release something to production, is make sure it can handle whatever number of users you're expecting. Luckily, with Autolab, we don't expect more than like a few hundred simultaneous users. So we kind of uh, get away with it, I guess. Uh, but that, that is, uh, so we are working on something called DevU, which is meant to be the Autolab killer and replace it, that will not have that issue, which will be very performant. Uh, Autolab from the ground up is not built to be very performant, unfortunately. But anyway, I don't want to get on that tangent. Um, so basically, you're load testing. Uh, your app should be ready for this. So uh, not, a be not the best DOS attack. Uh, then we switch to messing with content length. There's a few things we can do with content length. One, the one that we did was put the content length higher than the actual length of the content and uh, let the server try to deal with that. And for our homework servers, you know, that's going to get our simple servers. This is really why you don't, uh, one reason why you don't want to build your server from scratch. You don't want to build your own HTTP servers like we did on the homework in this class. As an educational exercise, yes, absolutely. Out there in production, you're going to use what's out there, what exists. You're going to use Nginx, Apache. You're going to use uh, Flask and frameworks and all this other stuff. Uh, you're going to use all that because it has more stuff <laughs> built in. Uh, it's more robust code. Um, but really, we're going to uh, set the content length to greater than the number of bytes in the body. Code gets stuck in an infinite loop. Server is sitting there on each connection like this. You send these requests in a loop like we did, and you have multiple infinite loops. Even if they're not threads, even if they are still concurrent connections that aren't multi-threaded, if we send enough of them, the server's still going to get bogged down. It's still going to slow down from this attack because it has to commit some resources to handling each one of those requests waiting for that last byte of information to come so it can finish processing that request and then send a response. So for, for prevention, you nailed this one too, we're going to set a timeout. On that loop, we're going to loop. And each time we iterate, instead of just looping until we read content length number of bytes, we're going to have some uh, timeout factor. We're going to say, well, if we get stuck in this loop for 10 seconds or, or whatever our timeout valuable we want, uh, then we're going to break out of this loop and close the connection and say, sorry, try again. And the user, if they are a legitimate user, they're going to have to refresh the page. Uh, by the way, I meant to mention that on that second slide. The DOS prevention is very much complicated by the existence, the threat, I guess, of false positives. You don't want to have a legitimate user just trying to use your app and have them get hit with a DOS protection and not able to use your app if they are a legitimate user. So distinguishing between an attack and a legitimate user and knowing that legitimate users can have very weird behavior sometimes that might look like DOS attacks uh, is where things get really, really tricky. Uh, that's where it gets hard. And then knowing that the attackers know that, so they take their game to the next level and say, well, I'm going to do everything I can to make my traffic look like legitimate users. And it's just endless cat and mouse on this stuff. Uh, so you set a timeout, and you say, if I haven't received any bytes in a while, close the connection. So the attacker goes to their next level, and they say, well, I'm just going to give you these, this data maybe one byte at a time, maybe 10 bytes at a time. And I'm going to set my content length to 6 trillion, and you're going to be sitting there waiting forever, for a long time for this to come in, because I'm going to make sure it takes like an hour. But I'm going to keep sending you bytes. I'm going to send you bytes, but I'm going to send you them very, very slowly. So this is a slow send attack. I forget what it's actually called, but I call it slow send. Uh, so I'm going to very slowly drip feed this data. And now on your prevention side, well, you can say, if I didn't get the full request in some timeout uh, variable, then we're going to sever the connection. But what happens when, I don't have it on this slide, but what happens when you have a legitimate user I'll just click the slide. What happens when you have a legitimate user with a slow connection? And you start timing them out because they took so long because they're on a 56K modem or something. I don't know. Maybe they just have choppy Wi-Fi because they're on campus or something. And now we're starting to say our legitimate users are uh, sending us a slow send attack. 
when really they were just trying to upload a large file because they wanted this uh, you know, 100 megabyte photo as their profile image. So they were actually just sending a very large file, and they had a slow internet connection. Now we hit them with DOS protection, and they can't upload that image. Legitimate user is going to get upset. Uh, in that example, we would just not let them upload that large of an image. Sure, there's other things we can do there, but there's going to be something like if you're a video upload site where people are constantly uploading videos, like that's your service, people are going to be sending you large files, and you can get hit with these slow send attacks and not really know it because it's going to look like legitimate traffic. Uh, so we can look for this, but it's not obvious anymore. And this is where we already hit the level where it's tricky to distinguish between those legitimate users and the attackers because the attacker is going to make sure their attacks look like this, make sure it looks like a legitimate slow speed user. Like what do you mean? You're, like, if, if you're allowing large file uploads, right? Mm -hmm. When you're expecting a large amount of data to come through somewhat slowly, depending on the user's connection, so how badly would that affect your app's performance? Um, yeah, that one's that one's hard to say, but yeah, you would have to be ready for your legitimate users at least. Mm -hmm. So if you do expect like a, a you know. 5% of your user base to have slow connections and your model is upload large amounts of data to my server. Yeah, I, I mean, you just, I guess you gotta be ready for that one. Uh, so part of this, uh, I don't have it on the slides, but part of this is uh, when you have an app in any situation, but an app like that especially, uh, you, it's common, how should I word this one? It's common to use a cloud service with auto scaling and uh, elastic scaling. So you would have a container. I should probably mention this. I should probably put this somewhere in the course content, actually. Uh, you do something like Kubernetes, which is a, a container orchestration software, which is going to automatically scale up and scale down your app as needed. And then you have that deployment on a cloud service like AWS. And then AWS will scale up like the number of instances, the number of containers, and the amount of resources that your app uses based on traffic. And then that's one of the DOS attacks. Uh, one of their goals can be to trigger that elastic scaling up. So give you a huge wave of traffic, you scale up, and now it's costing you a whole bunch of money that you're giving to Amazon to host your web service. And then they stop the, 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 the attack, and then you gotta scale down. All this scaling up and down can, uh, can be expensive. Uh, very, very expensive. But for your legitimate app, that would be the legitimate use of that. You would have something like Kubernetes to orchestrate all these containers in a cloud and then just automatically scale up when you get those, you know, on a, a busy day, you have a lot of users and a lot of them have slow connections and they all want to upload stuff. Like uh, uh, when text messaging first became a thing. We used to live in a world without text messaging. It was awful. But when text messaging was first a, a thing, it worked great. We're texting. Everybody's texting each other. The first New Year that hit, right at midnight, everybody on the planet's saying Happy New Year to everybody on their, their list. And it took like half an hour or so for some of those texts to go through. Like the next day, I feel like I was getting Happy New Year's messages because <laughs> the system just wasn't ready for something like that. Uh, so we, we like to prepare for things like that with uh, elastic containerization. But uh, yeah, and for our homework, we just, in the projects, we just use Docker Compose, which is the which is um, container orchestration, but at a much simpler level, it's not gonna automatically scale up and scale down. There's no need to use Kubernetes in this class though. So we're, uh, we're fine with that. Uh, I didn't expect to go on that tangent. Any other questions though while we are going on tangents? Does the attacker client have to send all these requests in a single thread uh, if you did a slow send attack in a loop? For for a single request, they'd all have to be set in one thread. No, you wouldn't. I mean, there are ways you could do it without multi-threading. Uh, no, yeah, my my code right there wasn't multi-threaded because I I opened the connection, I sent my request with not content length number of bytes in the body, 
and then went right on to opening the next connection. And I just never closed the connection. So that, uh, that wasn't multi-threaded. Oh, but oh, what the the slow send? Oh, sorry. Yeah, with the slow send attack, you wouldn't necessarily need separate threads, but you would need concurrency. Uh, whether your concurrency solution is separate threads or not uh, is up to the developer, but you would need concurrency. So basically, during presentations, we're all going to be trying to DOS attack the groups that's presenting. Yeah, basically, uh, since we're going to be using it. Yeah, kinda. Uh, in that context, I like calling it load testing because we're we're not going to be launching actual DOS attacks. Like the content length will be proper and everything, um, but uh, um, but we will be load testing. Okay. Uh, the the flip side of this could also be a slow read connection. So the uh, the client establishes a TCP connection with the server, sends their HTTP request gets an HTTP response, and then very slowly reads that HTTP response. For what's worth, this wouldn't work on our servers because we send the response and just close the connection right away. But if they're not closing the connection and waiting for the client to read all those bytes, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're going to have to keep that TCP connection open that whole time while they're reading the response. OK, this one was was mentioned before. This is the one I, I didn't uh, repeat and talk about much, but sin flood attack. Uh, this is a, a pretty scary one. It's uh, So recall how TCP connections work uh, from way back on Wednesday of week one, was it? Um, the client is going to send a sin, uh, sin packet get a send and ACK packet, and then send back the ACK packet. This is our three-way handshake to establish a TCP connection. For these SYN packets are random numbers, and the ACKs are those random numbers plus one. Uh, this is how we establish a TCP connection. Once it's established, then we start sending bytes back and forth over the connection. A SYN flood attack, we're going to send the SYN, and then that's it. That's it. That's all we do. Send that first SYN packet. So my client, which is going to be an attacker in this case, Send the sin. The server's going to send back a sin and an ack. And I'm not going to do anything with it. Except I'm going to do this in a loop and send a million of these things. I'm going to send them a whole bunch of sin packets. And what the server has to do now is wait for the response. The server's going to send this response and wait for this, this next ack. So somewhere in the server code, they got to be sitting there programmed to wait for this ack to come. Right, because that's how we're going to establish TCP connections. And I'm going to send lots of these SINs. The server is going to be spending resources to wait for all of those acts that are never going to get there. And if I send enough of these, I can prevent any new connections, any legitimate new connections from being created. This is a SIN flood attack. Uh, one of the advantages of this from the attacker perspective is it's super cheap. Sending these SIN packets is very cheap to do. I can, uh, you know, we can write code that sends lots, like ridiculous numbers of these things uh, very, very quickly. So the server is going to have all these half open connections, and it'll have some sort of timeout usually, but whatever that timeout is, um, we can, we're going to send sins faster than that timeout pretty much in every case. Uh, and the timeout can't be too large, too large, because there's going to be network delays here. Whatever that network delay is, times two. Uh, if somebody, again, has that slow connection and ping times are getting up to like a second, I mean, you should have like a two second timeout. Like, that's enough time to get all kinds of SYN packets sent. We're going to get lots of SYN packets sent. So, this is a way to take up all those network resources for the TCP connections. Okay, in prevention, uh, IP blocking this is the one that we're going to use in the project. So, I want to talk about what you'll be coding in the project. IP blocking is you see a lot of requests or suspicious behavior. For a project, it's going to be number of requests per 30 seconds. If you see too many requests, then, uh, or per 10 seconds, they're blocked for 30 seconds. Um, if you see too much activity or suspicious activity from an IP address, block that IP address. 
straightforward, pretty simple. Somebody's acting, uh, acting suspicious, block them. Uh, for your project, your requests are going to go through Nginx. And I, I mentioned this on, uh, not Friday, whenever it was, a while ago, it seems like. I don't remember. Um, two Fridays ago, two Friday lectures ago, the first week, first Friday of homework for content. Uh, when I was doing the, the deployment for your homework and for the project, for the project, I do recommend that you run Nginx in your droplet itself. Uh, I wouldn't run Nginx inside a Docker container for your project. I would run it right in your droplet. So actually install Nginx on your droplet and, and then uh, let CertBot do its thing from there. Got, otherwise, you have to bounce into your container to do the CertBot setup, which you know it's probably fine. I've never personally I've never done that before because it didn't, never made sense to me. But uh, running Nginx on your droplet and then telling CertBot to do its thing from there. And then forwarding the request to a specific port where you're running your app in a Docker container. Anyway, once you set that up, does that make sense? I, I don't know if that makes sense until you really get your hands in there on, a, on the server and start setting it up. Uh, but once you do set that up, Nginx, whether you do it in a container or not, Nginx will not, uh, your request from your server's perspective are going to be coming from Nginx, which is on localhost. So when you're doing IP blocking and you have Nginx as a reverse proxy, Nginx is going to be the sender of every request that you send. So you do have to do some extra configuration. And I mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating now that we're talking about IP blocking. Uh, Nginx will, uh, Nginx can forward that IP address to your server. So you have to get the actual IP address from the end user, forward that in a separate header, and send that to your app. So then your app has access to the IP address of the actual client, and you're not just blocking localhost. Because if you're blocking based on IP, and you're using the IP header from the request, and that header is Nginx's header, which is localhost, then uh, you're going to block everybody as soon as one person, or as soon as the total traffic of your entire app hits that threshold, you're blocking everybody on your app. So this will, of course, be something that we're looking for. It's in the testing procedures, something we're looking for while we're testing this. Make sure you're not using localhost as the IP address. Uh, make sure you're actually getting the real IP address from the client and using that in your uh, IP blocking code. Like there's something else I was going to say on that one. But... Any questions on that? Since this is the, the big takeaway that you actually have to code up on your project. Any questions on this part? Moving on. OK, so that's all DOS. But DDOS, this is the, the hot, cool new thing. This is what all the attacks actually are. This is what the successful attacks are going to be um, when you can just block an IP address when you find suspicious activity, like that's game over. You just block the IP address of the attacker, and now they can't attack you anymore. Problem solved, done. Don't have to do anything else. This is where DDoS comes in. Uh, for one, I won't talk about it, but IP addresses can be spoofed if you just change the IP address of your IP packets. Like you can just change the IP address as long as the Routers, and this is a little outside my expertise, but as long as the routers of the internet aren't, uh, don't have any protection against that, which uh, I don't see how they really would. I don't know. I don't know, but, but maybe they do. But uh, IP addresses can be spoofed with, uh, uh, with enough work. Now, you won't get your responses. So if you're spoofing your IP address, you would never get the responses. Um, but there is also just... Uh, coming back to my memory, an attack where you spoof your IP address to be the server that you want to attack and then send requests to another server who's going to send responses back to the server you're attacking and then flood them with responses. I don't know exactly how that works, how that's supposed to disrupt things, but, um, but it can flood them with IP packets. So DDoS, this is much more problematic 
And you hear this acronym because this is hard to prevent, which means these attacks are, um, I won't say these attacks are often successful, but often the successful attacks are DDoS attacks. So the D is for distributed. This is a distributed denial of service attack. Does, do modern web frameworks come with preventions for all these attacks out of the box? Uh, I, this is something I, I want to look into more. I don't think they do, but I believe Nginx and Apache do. But I, I don't, I got I to gotta study that more. I'm usually into building new features. Uh, so this is something I got to um, add to this lecture. You know, over the years, I'll, I'll expand this lecture, get some cool things in there. I'd like to be able to answer that question better. So DDoS is a distributed attack. So instead of one machine launching the attack, you get a bunch of machines launching the attack. It's just like a, a distributed system, you have a whole bunch of things working together. You have a whole bunch of machines, devices, IP addresses, importantly, a bunch of different machines all launching these attacks. Then you can pick and choose whatever variety of attacks that we talked about and launch them from multiple devices. This gets a lot more scary. So we're going to uh, distribute our uh, attacks. And the big question is, well, how do we get access to a whole bunch of machines? How is an attacker going to get a whole bunch of devices? Like, you can uh, go to Baldi 21 and get a whole bunch of devices there and, like, log into each one. You know, there are ways you can, but the best way, I guess, for attackers is to use a botnet. Uh, so viruses, back in my day, uh, what a virus used to be is... Uh, Somebody would try to get a virus to infect your machine. If you're downloading shady torrents or something, they would get a virus installed on your machine, and that virus would just wreck shit. It would destroy your machine, possibly try to brick it, and uh, you know they laugh because they, they destroyed your machine, and it's all funny and stuff. Uh, but they don't actually gain anything from this, so we don't really see these attacks anymore. Uh, people don't launch viruses like this anymore. I mean, I shouldn't say not at all, but... Uh, it's it's more rare because you know somebody just has to be kind of cruel, I guess. Like, what, what's the point? Uh, these days, what viruses are? I feel weird calling them viruses. I feel like there's a better term for it. But uh, what these viruses are is uh, they're going to infect your device and just run in the background without disrupting anything on your machine. Still get to use your machine as normal. Everything's fine. But then whenever the attacker wants. To, uh, and then whenever the attacker wants to use your device and use up some of your resources, they're going to send a signal to all of these devices that are infected, which we call a botnet. So they send, want to send a DDoS attack. They talk to their botnet and say, hey, all these devices that are infected that nobody even knows you're part of a botnet, go launch this DDoS attack. And then everybody bombards that server without even knowing. And some of those infected machines might actually be legitimate users. So you don't want to just block their IPs because they might be legitimate traffic in a different context as opposed to when they're acting as part of a botnet. Uh, so this gets a bit scary.